The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss the world of seeds, what that all means, their names, and how they can benefit you, as well as spring lawn maintenance. And our guest is Kelly Smith Tribble, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023, through our parent website, that is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, underneath the Season 7 tab at the top of the page, in-studio video replay, podcast replay, radio app, however you're doing it. Thank you very much. You want to be part of the program, you can do that by sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call anytime, 24-7, coast to coast. It's toll free at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. The world of seeds, Holly, there's a lot of different terminology that's out there, and it can be very confusing for many people, advanced and intermediate and beginners. Absolutely. And there's also, I think, just a lot of misinformation in general or um, people relying on other people who might not have the best information or most accurate information. So let's start with the first one, organic, and you'll see this. A lot of times, especially if you're in your garden center, you'll see the regular seeds and then you'll see the organic seeds and it says certified USDA organic or or certified organic, what have you. Not just a sticker. Not just a sticker. So organic seeds can be any combination of seed that was grown under organic conditions and certified by usually USDA. Um, And that's pretty much it. They these I shouldn't say that's it. It's not like it's an easy process for, for a lot gardeners. of paperwork, yeah, a lot of a lot certification of, that's required to right. get these seeds to be able to be labeled that. But it doesn't mean that they're any better or worse than any other seeds. It's just basically a certification. Yeah, it's kind of my. I, I, it's, it's a very broad, generic comparison. It's like making cake with the really high brand flour versus the El Cheapo flour. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, um, no. But like. Most people, if they're going to make a cake and they want it to be the best cake, they're going to use something like cake flour. Right. But, um, now, certified organic, these seeds, as you said, was ha- have been monitored basically uh, by the Department of Natu- or the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and for people who are growing plants in order to save with this certification, the fields have to be a certain proper. They have to get you know soil tests, make sure there's no chemicals there. Even if the farmer or gardener uses a liquid inorganic fertilizer that, or we, a uh, uh, plant food that many people use that's a miracle and it's green or pink or blue, that can throw it off and it's no longer certified. So specific feedings or fertilizers also have to be certified in order for it to be all goody goody. All, all organic, yeah, absolutely. And that's something to. I guess to keep in mind when you're seeing that that buzzword organic. Right. Um, so then there's the heirloom variety. And the heirloom variety just basically means that it is the original cultivator. A lot of times, like when people think about heirloom, they think about a family heirloom. Here's this vase. The oldie family, but goodie. The oldie but goodie. Passed down by generation to generation. Sometimes you might not even see heirloom seeds at the store because they are passed down from family to family. And one of the biggest ones like that is tomatoes. Right. Brandy wines are a very popular uh, heirloom. Uh, mortgage Lifter is another one that's very popular. I'm not sure if black What's, creme is, but... Uh, I'm not sure either, but with like leeks, it's the... Uh, American, American yep. leek. Yep. So you'll find... Tried and true. You'll find heirloom varieties in pretty much any seed 
um, but you might not find them at the store. You can tell the tomatoes that are heirloom variety typically don't look like that super round, pretty shiny red tomato. They're a little bit more, I don't know, earthy looking. Natural. <laughs> Natural looking, yes. I guess. Not yeah. so conformed to the requirements that you know look pretty on the shelf. It's They don't look pretty on the shelf because they have multiple different contortions and they taste better because of that. Absolutely. And sometimes like if you see cooking shows, um, they'll say like these are heirloom tomatoes. If you want like a good visual, um, just they, Google, just, just Google, yeah. I mean, just Google, but maybe you've heard it before. So then we have the, we'll move on to the GMO. Well, let's go. Yeah. Okay. GMO genetically modified organisms. This is seeds in which have been altered in a laboratory to get specific traits into the seed. Now, this, these seeds you're not going to get from your garden center, from you know your big box store, nothing like that. Genetically modified seeds. Uh, there are some in the vegetable and fruit world. However, the predominant uh, amount of them is in the big ag industry. The wheat, soybeans, um, uh, milo, uh, canola, um, corn, all of these things are genetically modified. They are modified in order to handle the basis of this is to handle the harsh chemicals which are sprayed on the fields in order to kill everything but the plant they're growing. Corn, for example, you got hybrid GMO corn. The corn DNA has been altered to handle the harsh weed killing uh, chemical that is sprayed to kill all the everything but the plant that you're growing. Now, many people do not like genetically modified or want to eat genetically modified. My opinion, which is not certified at all, it's just my opinion, it's not that the corn is bad to eat. It is the chemicals that have been sprayed on the corn that the corn has been altered to accept and not die from because a normal heirloom corn, you spray the round chemical on it, it will die within you know a couple of hours. But this other stuff in the field, they're spraying harsh stuff all the time and they have to intensify the chemical makeup of it because the weeds are becoming super weeds. So they have to up the potency and then they have to alter the DNA, the, the DNA of these seeds in order to handle the more stronger strain of chemical that they're spraying on the weeds. Right. But you're not going to buy this in the garden center. You're not going to buy this big box store. You have these are companies that ha that farmers have to sign contracts with in order not to save the seeds and rebuy each year. So don't worry about it in your backyard. Right. That's the thing is I just wanted to hit on was that these GMO seeds are not available to a, an average consumer. There has to be, like Joey said, a, a whole contract, a whole – it's a whole thing. And, and, you know, you might get a strain that flies in on corn because it's five miles away. But your tomatoes, your peppers, your, you're not going to have this. You're not purposely going to be able to buy – any of this stuff, the genetically modified stuff. Hybrid, on the other hand, is not a genetically modification, but some people may interpret it as being because it's hybrid. Okay, yep. So hybrid is when a botanist, for example, takes two favorable um, plants and then grows that plant basically with science, <laughs> using their science to create the, the more favorable plant. So say, for example, we'll just use tomatoes here because that's a good example um something like the early girl variety they use the 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 drought resistant i believe and then um a fast growing variety tomato to create that early girl variety and so this way you get a good best of both worlds best of both worlds um if you are new to gardening, a lot of new gardeners like hybrids because they are easy to grow. More disease resistant They are as more well. disease res resistant, yep. And there's nothing wrong with using hybrid varieties. But if you do save the seeds from hybrid varieties, they will default back to one of the... Um, you're still going to get the parents. variety. You'll, yeah, you'll, you'll still get a tomato. Like yeah. You're not going to get a cucumber. But it's going to default back to the parents. So one of the parents. So like say like an early girl, for example... You might get a different type of tomato, but not the early growth tomato. So in the hybrid world, Holly, we see then on the some packages, F1, F2, F3, F4. What? Obviously, that's not a a a, 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 um, a gnome to you know Formula One racing because F1 is you know Formula One. 
it's a bad joke that you don't get because you don't follow European racing. What does when we I get your joke? You get the jokes. Okay. What does these numbers and letters represent on a seed packet if it's not a GMO, but it's a form of an offshoot of a hybrid? Right. So F one is basically like the first hybrid variety. Okay. And then F two is the second hybrid variety. But we're still not. It's still not good to save those seeds. No. Because they are classified hybrid. And it doesn't happen as much with like garden garden plants. Mm-hmm. It happens more with hemp growing and okay. other the strains in which they're yeah. creating. Yep. And that's a whole another conversation. Right. Um, and many states are legal in that, and there's a whole business uh, outlook and, and and trajectory on that as well. So. If you've got your seeds or you need seeds, if you need more seeds, you can go to jungseeds.com and use coupon code 10TG23 to save 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. That is 10TG23. Uh, you can find all of the coupons that uh, our sponsors provide at our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, underneath the money tab at the top of the page just like Walton's Incorporated has provided for you. Yeah, Walton's, um, we brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's. We know you care about where your food comes from. Canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables is great. But what about the meat? At Walton's, you can get the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and other, any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people will actually like? Walton's created meatjustics.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has a full line of their meat grinders, mixers, and sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's, everything but the meat. You can use code GROW50, GROW50, to save 10% off your order of $50 or more. When we come back, it's spring lawn maintenance. What you should be doing in order to help your lawn look a little greener and healthier. You're tuned into the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products that last a lifetime. They're built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from Rocky Mountain source materials, are soft and comfortable, keep your feet warm and dry, and come with a lifetime guarantee. Even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High-quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. They fit in with all the many things you do from around the house to the outdoors and beyond. They are comfortable and long-lasting. These socks are great for gardening because they keep your feet so comfortable no matter the conditions outside. It's hard to overstate how amazing these feel to have warm, dry feet as you work in your garden. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at grip6.com. Use coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at grip6.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest, none the worse perhaps than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need rescue ant baits. Rescue ant baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Dripping Springs Oyas clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas, O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. 
Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Happy you are with us today. Farm to be feet. Holly helps us all harvest and grow better. Yes, farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming or working outside. Farmer sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skins for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves are offer cooler cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicky material with UBF Protection factor of 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all those great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. Well, this past week, some of us uh, in the listening audience had about uh, 72 hours of summer one. And I had my straw hat on from Farmers Defense to keep me from frying. And it worked very well. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy about this because um, Joey is a hair challenge on the top of his head uh-huh. and I get worried that he's going to burn his head. So I'm glad that we have the farmer's defense hat for him. Uh, Farmersdefense.com. All right, Holly, while you're in the garden working and or in the yard, you can also use farmer's defense uh, products, but there's some lawn maintenance for spring in which we need to do, whether we're wanting a pristine manif- uh, uh, manicured lawn or we just want the grass to grow and look decent. There are some things in which we need to be doing now, once the snow melts in some areas, that uh, helps our lawn grow better. Right. So you want to prepare your lawn for spring because it sets you up. If you're a lawn person and you want to spend a lot of time on your lawn, it sets you up for a nice lawn when you prepare it in the spring for the summer. So the first thing you want to do is clear the debris. So anything like... Um, sticks, leaves, any any debris that has been left over from the winter, you want to rake that away. Or is blown in. Or is blown <laughs> yeah. in, yeah. Uh, and then you want to, if your yard is heavily trafficked, whether by human or animal or children or however you want to define that, uh, and, it ha- and it's been, you know, kind of weak looking, a good aeration uh is a is a suggestion that would work very well. Aeration is, or a plug machine it removes plugs of soil out and creates cavities for water and fertilizer to get to the root zone. If you're not in a heavily uh, tra- uh, uh, trafficked area, you you know avoiding that would be the way to go, and, and a good thatching would be best. Uh, thatching about one inch um, of the thatching would be better. Thatching is uh, one inch thick. I, I mean, uh, thatching is a way of removing the decaying or dried grass particles between the soil and the grass to allow moisture and fertilizer to get to it. Uh, oftentimes, the grass, you can just take a rake and see um, and gently press down. You'll like see a metal tine. A metal tine yeah. rake, yeah. Not a, uh, a hard tine rake. And you'll see the grass particles that have died and fell to the ground under the, the grass, how much, how thick that is, because that can prohibit or in, inhibit the water and fertilizer. Oftentimes when people thatch and then they water, all of a sudden the lawn is just 
explodes with greenness and they didn't do anything, well, that's because of all the fertilizer they put down that couldn't get to the soil because it sat on top of the, the, de- the, the decaying grass matter. Yeah, it allows the the um, underside of it to... And to you don't have to buy a machine to thatch. No. I mean, there are out there, and some people will attach them to their, their riding lawnmowers, but you can just do it, like a, you said, with a metal tine rake. Not a hard tine rock rake, but a, a metal tine rake, and it works quite well. Yeah, absolutely. So then you want to overseed your lawn, which you're like, does that make sense? That's am I wasting, counterintuitive. Yeah, am I wasting my seed? But no, you're, if your lawn is sparse or thin, overseeding it can help fill in those bare spots. And basically you just uh, spread the grass over your existing lawn to encourage the grass seed yeah. over your existing lawn to encourage new growth. And then you want to make sure that you do choose the right type of grass seed for your climate and the soil type to ensure it grows properly. If you're not sure, again, we always suggest going to your local independent garden center and they can help you with that. Uh, ask, you know, tell them, walk up to them and go, hey, here's where I'm at. Here's what I need help on. Can you help me? And if they're worth anything, they will help you and get you the right product, not the product that, you know, is most expensive. So keep that in mind. Fertilizing your lawn. Fertilizing your lawn is important. It is an important step to the health and well-being of your lawn. A good fertilizer will provide your lawn with nutrients that it needs to grow strong and healthy. It's important to choose the right type of fertilizer, folks, because... Uh, your lawn and, and apply at the right time because you can go to the garden center, the big box store, and just grab something that's on sale or it looks, you know, oh, that says lawn on it. So we'll go ahead and apply it and you can be potentially doing more damage or adding too much or wasting your money by buying the wrong product. And then you're not happy because you spent too much money. The lawn didn't do what it was supposed to do based on the back of the fertilizer bag. So you, you got to keep that in mind. Absolutely. And you want to, um, when you are, if you are going to seed your lawn or do any of these things, especially, but especially seeding your lawn, you may want to block that portion off from children or any traffic that might occur on your lawn. And that way it gives it a chance to grow instead of getting like mashed into the soil. Yeah. You just, just all the work you put into it, you want to, uh, make sure you don't have extra traffic. Now, when, should you mow your lawn in the spring you want to wait until the temperatures have been consistently reaching at least 40 degrees fahrenheit now that means at night because it can be really warm in the day but you can get temperatures back down freezing point at night uh so fahrenheit 40 degrees consistent for those of uh, for for those who follow the celsius measure you're gonna have to do your conversion because we're american people we didn't learn that (laughs) But you know what? It would I, it would be helpful. I have ventured into buying shoes from the UK, and everything's measured in centimeters, uh-huh. which is helpful. And then sometimes it's measured in millimeters, and all you have to do is move over one decimal point. Okay. And then you know. And that's our math class for math today. Class, math class for today. Trying to cut your grass that hasn't fully thawed, like I talked about, waiting if it's cold at night uh, from the winter snap, uh, can damage the tender... Uh, can damage it and can hurt the blade of your lawn more. So make sure the grass is dry. Here's something that many people often, you know, it's, oh, it's due. We'll just go ahead and mow. Now, here's the difference here. If you're going to mow grass because you just need to mow grass and you don't care what it looks like and it looks like you're ready to bale hay for the cattle, go right ahead. But if you're one of those individuals that care about how your lawn looks because of whether you're in an HOA or you just take great pride in mowing your grass and, and making it pristine, then you want to wait for the grass to dry. And if it, based on the humidity and the cloud cover, if it's not going to dry, don't mow it today. Uh, so, you know, th- determining that um, your grass has to reach the proper height too in order to mow, and it's based on the type of grass and your area when that is. Uh, to mow it. So, you know, on the farm, we just had stuff grow in the yard and it was dandelions and lamb quarters and fescue and grass and weeds and we just mowed it whenever it needed mowed. We didn't have sod laid down uh, or specific varieties of grasses in order to have a lush lawn. If you do it correctly, walking on a lawn that has been pristinely manicured is a very pleasant experience. Absolutely. One thing I did want to mention about mowing your lawn is making sure this is the time now and even in the fall is making sure that your lawnmower is maintained and ready. 
So sometimes people have um, older lawnmowers or hand-me-down lawnmowers, whatever, and it may it may be it may run okay, but maybe it needs a new blade or it needs some sort of I don't know lawnmower tune-up, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're thinking, well, it still cuts, but it it doesn't cut; it gnaws. It gnaws, yeah. And also, when if you have to go over the lawn more than once, that's not efficient <laughs> or fuel efficient. And if it's right. also just like tearing your grass up, that's not good either. So I would highly recommend um, doing some sort of lawnmower maintenance and calling, you know, your local small small maintenance shop and finding it, out. Yeah, how trying to find the in. independent one. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a lot of hardware stores yes. can refer you in that case. Uh, three inches high is really the place in which is a good, safe, uh, recommended mowing height, and that's simply because keeping that grass high. Unlike when I grew up on the farm, we put her all the way down because the lower we mowed it, the longer it took before we had to mow it again. The taller the uh, grass is, it shades out weeds and weed seeds and keeps the soil cooler. And taller grass means longer roots and greater ability to withstand drought and reach the nutrients in which you've been putting in or naturally in the soil. So there is a means to that madness that you may think three inches, that's extremely tall. But if you do it right and over a number of years, it will continue to give back to you. And um, by keeping it three inches high, this also prevents some lawnmower damage because Typically, if you cut it real low, you're going to hit blades are going to hit, you know, dirt and and uh, debris that you don't see in the grass, little rocks or pebbles. By keeping it up, you're not going to have that interference with your blades and a sharp blade, just like a knife. A sharp blade is a safe blade, whether you're using a riding push or manual lawnmower. And some people that's a big thing, Holly, people cut you know they have a small little lawn and they use a manual lawnmower if you've never seen a manual lawnmower some most of you have but google that it's does it have it's a motor like um a, like a cylinder what do they call it a barrel like a, a yeah, barrel yeah yeah a it, cylinder. It, it doesn't have a motor no it it, doesn't it's have environmentally a motor. friendly <laughs> and it's yeah exactly it's, i've used it it's not that difficult no it's not that difficult and it's it's really like joey said if you have a small lawn and you don't have a lot of grass to cut first of all it's Obviously, it doesn't take any electricity or gas, but second of all, it saves space. So uh-huh. if you have the ability to mow your lawn with a manual lawnmower, I say go for it. Yeah. Uh, they're easy to find. Um, they're you know a one-time investment. You don't have to you know do a whole lot of anything with them. Well, Holly, soon the weather will be warming up. We had a little touch earlier. Now we're kind of in where we're at here in the upper Midwest. It's cold again. But the Japanese beetles will soon be here, and we need to take care of them so they don't damage our summer. Absolutely. With spring here, you want to start thinking about those beetles and grubs in your garden or your yard. We find all sorts of people are always talking about Japanese beetles. Um, Yeah. Grub gun can be applied to your turf or garden around ornamentals to control the grubs and lessen the impact that those beetles have on your lawn this summer. Easy to use. Apply with a commercial spreader or irrigate right into the soil. Biologically controlled, uh, biologically specifically created to target grubs and beetle invaders without harming beneficial insects such as your ladybugs, butterflies, and bees. Absolutely. And to be honest, it's the only non-chemical that works. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. When we come back, hang out with us. Kelly Smith Tribble will be with us. Author, you're tuned in to the Guarding with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Tree hugger sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent 
independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers, and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit RootMaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at RootMaker.com. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in and check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest and their vegetables are incesticide free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus, take care of your lawn with grass seed, fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. The important job of weeds? It's time for this week's Garden Fun Fact. Weeds are simply nature's way of covering up bare soil. They are genetically designed to germinate, propagate, and grow faster than most of your garden plants. Use a natural mulch such as shredded leaves or dry chemical-free seed-free grass clippings to cover that bare soil to prevent weeds from growing. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs, environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use code free ship for me. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show moments away. Author Kelly Smith Tribble, but first, Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even thousands of miles before it hits your plate, Harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your own home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information to get your Rise Garden, you can visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Kelly Smith Trimble is an author, editor, writer, and master gardener living in Knoxville, Tennessee. Her second book, The Creative Vegetable Gardener, was released earlier this year. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're happy that you've joined us on the program. And I'm going to start with this question. Mulch is is a virtue to most gardens. What are your favorite ways to use mulch? And what are some of your favorite mulches to use in the garden? Yeah, so um, mulch is definitely very important in the garden. It helps shade the soil and um, protect protect the soil. I practice intensive planting, so planting things, you know, really pretty closely together. That helps in itself help shade the soil, so you don't really need as much mulch as you might if you were, you know, really spacing things out. But I do still mulch, and so um, I like to use compost as mulch throughout the season, so adding compost both to add nutrients, but also to kind of layer on top of the soil and shade the soil. And then I also will do a practice of using um, lettuce and um, other low-growing crops as a living mulch. So I'll like sow lettuce underneath taller crops like tomatoes or peppers to kind of shade the soil. But then I also use regular mulches too. So I tend to use cedar mulch. That's just one that I like in my garden. Um, I like straw mulch, but I found that I'm allergic to it. So I don't use straw mulch in my garden. So those are just a few of the mulch options that I like. Now, when you talk about using uh, lettuce at, or low-growing crops, now you're going to plant them about you know earlier, but you're not going to plant them when the plants, the tomatoes or peppers have a large canopy, correct? It's just in the early stages, or how does that work? For yeah, you? yeah. Sometimes I will. So you know, kind of layering in terms of of the timing of planting. So in the spring, I'll have um, greens, I'll have lettuce, and then I can 
um, plant tomatoes or something that's going to be more of a summer crop in the in the middle of that. And as the tomato will grow, the lettuce can um, can stay down at the the lower level and get shaded out by the tomatoes at the the higher level. So it's kind of a mutual benefit um, for both plants, and that and that enables me to have a longer um, harvest season for the lettuce as well. Absolutely. So many of us, you know, we learn from our mistakes in the garden. What is a major gardening mistake that you made and you're like, I'm never going to do that again that you definitely <laughs> learn from? Yeah. So I've made plenty of mistakes <laughs> in both life and gardening. And, um, but one of them that I, you know, it's, it's one of those mistakes that I, I do regret, but I, you know, not completely is planting my mint directly in my garden. So mint spreads through runners in the soil and at least where I live in the southeast it goes rampant and so I planted mint directly in my garden even knowing better (laughs) and I pull up wheelbarrow loads full of mint every season Um, spring summer and fall I have so much mint you know if I let it go it would just be a mint garden Um, the one that the type of mint that has grown that that spreads, I feel like more than any other is apple mint. Um, and I, I planted one, um, just one little sprig of apple mint in my garden and now I have it everywhere. Um, so I, I pull that up all the time. It was definitely a mistake to plant it directly in the ground, but there are some benefits to it too, because apple mint and, and lots of mints, but apple mint in particular has this beautiful purple bloom and it attracts tons of bees and, beneficial wasps. So I do leave some of it in the garden. I don't pull all of it out. Um, But if I ever planted mint again in a different garden, I would plant it in a container. (laughs) Now, we encourage organic means of anything, and we don't judge those who do not choose to follow that. But for people who may have that issue, they may go to a a very harsh chemical to kill off uh, the areas. Was that ever something that ever crossed your mind? Hey, I've got to control this. Let's just kill it off and start again. No, it really hasn't. You know, I I um I don't mind so much. You know, I, it was a mistake, but I don't mind so much pulling the mint out. You know, it smells good. It's it's not really hurting anything. Um, in the garden, it's just taking up more space than I, you know, want it to take up. But it's not. Um, you know, it's not like evil. So there's worse things that could be growing. <laughs> yeah, there's worse things to do than just pull up, you know, great smelling mint on a Saturday morning. So that's just what I do. Absolutely. So your newest book, The Creative Vegetable Gardener, was published a couple months ago. What's a tip or something in that book that will pique our listeners' interest or just encourage them to go out and get a copy? Yeah. So the book is full of tips. It's really, um, pretty broad and covers lots of different topics. But one tip that I like to bring up um, is is to let some of your crops bloom, crops that you wouldn't um, typically let bloom. So things that um, bolt in your garden and you normally will pull them out when they bolt. Like a lot of biennials do that, Um, carrots and parsnips and then some greens like lettuce and um, collard greens. Um, Those are things that they, once they start blooming, they stop producing what we are usually growing them for, you know, the roots or um, the leaves. But if you leave those things in to bloom in your garden, there's a few benefits. Um, One is that a lot of them will attract pollinators, other beneficial insects to the garden. Parsnip blooms are absolutely beautiful. And when I've let them um, stay in my garden and bloom, they're just teeming with insects. Um, And then you also learn about the life cycle of those plants that you never would have, you never would have seen a collard green or, you know, a collard or mustard bloom if you hadn't let that plant stay in the garden to, um, to bolt and bloom. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people would pull it, but I encourage people at least for, um, you know, an experiment to let things bolt and bloom in their garden just to see what happens. Carrot seeds. Is something that, yeah. may, but you have to keep that. You know, you understand that carrots have a. Uh, I forget what the other wild wild plant is. It's very similar to uh, carrot seeds. What it looks like, anyway. Like the wild parsnips or queen ants. Queen queen ants. Oh, queen ants. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But just neat to see how that little thing left alone can produce this really pretty flower, and then have hundreds of seeds. Yeah. To save it's just n- yeah. neat. 
Yeah, absolutely. It is really neat. It's so I was watching, uh, I have some blooming collards um, in my garden right now. And I was watching actually this afternoon, birds come to those and start to harvest the seed pods from, from the collards. Um, so that was really neat just to see that it was, you know, feeding some wildlife in my garden. Absolutely. So in your book, you talk about planting in a labyrinth. So for those who don't know what a labyrinth is, what is that? And how do you suggest creating that in a smaller backyard or maybe just the feel of one? Yeah. So a labyrinth is, um, it's really a, a walking path, a winding walking path that is meant to encourage um meandering or like walking meditation. Um, It's similar in a way to a maze, if you can kind of picture a maze, except a maze is meant to confuse you and a labyrinth is really meant to, to calm you. So you're kind of just like walking on this path. Typically they go inward and then kind of come out again. And they're used in a lot of different spiritual practices and a lot of cultures throughout the world. Um, and I kind of included it in a in the book as an example of a different type of garden or a different type of landscape that could inspire garden design. Um, most people don't have the space necessarily um, to create a, a vegetable garden labyrinth in their backyard, although I have seen examples of them. Um, but a spiral is a really good example of kind of a simple um, version of a labyrinth. And the benefit to me of that is this idea that you kind of can be in inside your garden and you can use um, the garden as both a space of production, but also a space of kind of meditation and calming. Um, and so there is a, a great example of a spiral garden. Um, uh, it's a garden actually in Wisconsin, um, an artist who created this garden that is a really fun spiral shape. So that I think kind of mimics the idea of, of a labyrinth. A place of calming. I, I think whether you're in the garden or in the woods, uh, we all need a, a time of calming in the society that we live in. Yes, absolutely. The garden can, can really provide that. And I think um, taking that into account when you're designing your garden um, can really increase that benefit for you. Is the garden that you're referring to in Wisconsin, is that the one in West Bend or? It's in Kenosha. Okay. Yeah. Because I know there's a small labyrinth um, creative garden in West Bend, but I'll have to. Yeah, I think I've, I think I've heard of that. This, this is a a woman, an individual in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She's an artist and I found her garden just looking at hashtag spiral garden (laughs) on Instagram. And it's really probably my favorite garden in the book. I just love it. Well, you encourage people to plant perennials and annuals paired together. And some people may think that that's counterintuitive. What are some of your favorite ways to do so? And and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there are um, reasons to not plant perennials and annuals together. And there are definitely some perennial crops that I think do deserve their own spot. Asparagus is definitely one of those because it stays in the same space for so many years, it can grow, you know, for 15 years or so. But um, I do think there are some perennials that can be good pairs with annual crops and that can kind of anchor um, an annual vegetable garden. Um, some of those are edible, some are not edible. Some of the edibles are more leaning towards herbs. So perennial herbs um, like rosemary and sage, tarragon, thyme, these are plants that I have kind of interspersed throughout my garden um, where I do plant my annuals. And so there are things that, at least in my area, I can harvest um, some of them throughout the winter um, and they can provide some winter interest, but they can also provide some pest control when they're paired with with the annual crops. Um, and then I also include some you know, tender perennials that are not edible, like um, echinacea is one that I really love. It attracts pollinators in the summer. Bees are all over it. And then um, even though it dies back in the winter, I leave some of those um, brown stalks in the garden through the winter and um, native bees can um, nest in there. Other insects can nest in there. So there can be multiple benefits of including perennials, um, both edible and non-edible perennials in the space where you're going to be gardening um, or growing annuals. Fantastic. So we've really enjoyed having you on the program. How can our listeners find out more about you and get your great books? 
Yeah, so you can find the books, um, Vegetable Gardening Wisdom and The Creative Vegetable Gardener, anywhere you buy books online, as well as, um, you know, hopefully um, visiting your local bookstores. If you don't see it there, I'd love for you to ask for them to, to get it for you. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at Kelly Smith Trimble. And I do have a website. It's kellysmithtrimble.com. Um, not as active there on the website, more on social media. So, um, yeah, I hope you will look for the, the books and, and follow me, follow me, follow along with me. Well, Kelly, we greatly appreciate the time and the knowledge you've shared with Holly and myself and all of our listeners today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answer. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Worried about watering too much or too little? Tree Diaper Technology is the best way to stabilize your soil moisture in your garden, trees, or house plants. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Beer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep beer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous, invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Happy that you are with us today. It's time for questions and answers. Your questions are answers. If you've got a question, you can send that on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call anytime, toll-free, coast-to-coast. That number is 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. So this question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. How far apart should I plant each tomato plant and then peppers and basil? Okay. Pepper uh, tomatoes, let's start with that. You can minimum, if you're doing cages, two foot. If you're doing Florida weave, you can squeeze them about 18 inches because you don't have the cages to, if you're really needing to get as many in as possible, uh, is, you know, about 18 inches, two foot to 18 inches. With peppers, I mean, three, if you've got plenty of space and you've got a 40 acre field and space is not a problem, three to four foot apart. So you can get in there, get air circulation, go ahead and harvest the tomatoes, all the things you need to do. If you are with uh, peppers, is about 18 inches because a good pepper is going to bush out. And by the time you harvest your peppers, you want your peppers to be a hedge of peppers. Now, it's not scientifically proven, but many gardeners over the years have found that whenever you have peppers touching leaves or holding each other's hand, they seem to produce better. 
Don't know how clinically scientific that is, but we have seen that as well. So you want this hedge of peppers. So 18 inches, good spacing. And basil, 18 to 24 inches, 18 inches uh, to two foot spacing because a basil plant can get quite large and produce a lot of limbs and leaves for you. So you don't want to crowd them. And the problem with basil that we've seen, if you crowd it too much, the leaves can't dry off when you water or it rains. And then you get mold issues. And then you've got a whole nother mess that you got to deal with. So you want good air circulation. So two foot uh, is a good number on uh, the basil plant. So there you go. That's uh, a, a, a long answer for a short answer there, Holly. Okay, how about this one here? Which is better, mixing coffee grounds in the soil or compost them in my compost bin? So I don't think one is better than the other. They're about equal. If you, done right. If done right, yeah. So if, you're, if you are going to mix them into the soil, you want to mix them in. You don't want to just broadcast them across the soil. You want to take a little... Uh, you know, metal rake or uh, cultivator tool and cultivate them into the soil. You don't have to do it deep, but just make sure that they're mixed into the soil nicely. And then with the compost, you can just put them in your compost and they'll do their thing there. So there's not really like a right or wrong way to use coffee grounds, but um, whether it be in the garden or in the compost, but you just want to make sure that if you are putting them in your garden, that you get them nice and mixed in. And you can include the filters. Uh, if you're going to add them to the coffee or the coffee grounds and the filters to your compost bin, I wouldn't go no more than about 10% volume because otherwise you're going to have this giant muck mess of coffee grounds. Now, coffee grounds contain nitrogen, uh, potassium, and phosphate. And unlike what the, the myth is that, oh, it'll make your soil acidic. We've talked about this in the program, I don't know how many times over the last seven years. That is a garden myth. There's university extension studies and everything in between showing statistically that there is very little to almost no acidity in the coffee grounds because that has been brewed out during the coffee making process. So if you think you're going to include your coffee grounds around your blueberry plants uh, because they like acidic soil, your blueberry plants are still not going to do good no matter how much coffee grounds you put around them. So uh, they're good for bringing organic matter in, uh, the worms, worms love them, but uh, mixing them in, uh, we've we've figured a rough estimate, a five-gallon bucket over about 40 square feet uh, every couple of months would be about a good number because you don't want to add too much uh, because it was, you know, overcompensate. And if you don't mix it in, you're not going to, you're going to lose the nitrogen uh, because it will evaporate out of the grounds, and then you'll create this crust that is impermeable to rain or water, so you're not helping that at all either. So do both, and uh, you'll be good to go. Absolutely. So our next question is, I'm going to be putting in a new strawberry bed, and I have read and seen over and over that you need to pinch off the flowers the first year. I did not do this, and I have, I have, um, and I have berries. I do not recall what size they were. Okay, so we're going to give you the university, Iowa State University Extension Office's answer, and then we'll give you our experience answer. Okay, so. <laughs> The university says during the first growing season, all the blossoms should be removed from June bearing ba ba strawberries. If flowers are allowed to develop into berries, their development will reduce plant growth, runner produ production, and the size of next year's crop. You can check them once a week to remove the blossoms. Those are on the June bearing. With ever bearing and day neutral strawberries, you remove all the blossoms until early July. Any flowers which bloom after this period may be allowed to develop into fruit. The first berry should ripen in August and continue until frost. Okay, so that's the university answer. That is, I guess, what people may some people may say the the right answer. The science answer. The, the science answer. Now, we grew June bearing for a number of years, and we got them from root uh, starts in a little bundle, and they all looked dead, and we planted them. This was back in 2011, and we never pinched anything off. Every berry that would come on that thing, we would harvest. And I can't. I don't recall any time that I was thinking, boy, this is not good. These are not these plants don't look healthy. And by the third or fourth year, tomato, uh, uh, strawberries will typically grow five to seven years. By the fourth, fifth, sixth year, we were getting 15 to 20 pounds of strawberries out of our 150 square foot strawberry patch as they produce daughter plants. And those daughter plants continue to produce strawberries. You can do what the science says, and you can talk to a lot of gardeners who say they never pulled them off, as 
our experience, uh, and they did just fine. So can't give you a good answer there, I guess. <laughs> I mean, is it the end of the world that you didn't pinch the growth off? No. It, it'll catch up. Yeah. I, I think stuff always just catches up. Um, so th- we have another question yes. about what do you put in the hole when you're planting tomatoes? Well, that's a whole show in itself. Right. But- uh, what we we used to make a, a phenomenal concoction of this and that and all of these things. We just use an all purpose, all balanced organic fertilizer that's under a ten ten ten. It's like a six four six something, uh, because anything over a triple ten, you're adding too much fertilizer to the hole that that plant will not be able to utilize during the growing season. Now, if you're in Florida or you're in South Alabama or you're in Texas, yeah, you can use a triple 10, triple 15, something of a higher number because you've got a longer growing season. But for most of us who are listening to the program, our growing season is very short, so we don't want to over fertilize or use too much or, or spend more money than what we need to. Some people will say, put the tums and powdered milk and all this stuff. Or a or, or, or balanced fertilizer and regular watering will solve 99.5% of the, all the problems your tomato plant could ever face and mulching. And that takes care of the other four tenths. So you've got about one tenth of a percent of problems if you, uh, that is left. If you water, mulch, and just use a regular fertilizer, you've got pretty much no problems with your tomato plants. Absolutely. Okay. I have aphids on my pepper seedlings. What is the best way to kill them off inside? Well, if you're inside, you really don't want to use a harsh chemical. And and the same could be said for peppers or other plants outside in your garden if they're infested with aphids. So here we've got a couple of suggestions here. Holly, what do we got? Sure. So you can use um, uh, a spray bottle with you want to use um, an acesticidal soap. And so then you would basically um, combine that, you would dilute it with water and you would just follow the directions for aphids or it'll say like, I think soft body uh-huh. insects. Yeah. So you'd follow that directions in a, um, whether it be like a handheld spray bottle or a, or or a pump sprayer. From Chapin. Chapin's yeah. got good. And, and if you don't want to go with the insecticidal soap, you can just fill that thing with, with warm water, set the tray in the tub and just blast it with you know a mist and it'll dislodge a lot of those aphids right uh that's a good way some people will go in there with like rubber gloves and smash as many as they can that's up to you um you can use cold press neem oil not just neem oil you need to not just neem oil you need the cold press if you just get the neem oil they've taken all the stuff out that actually kills the bugs so cold press neem oil uh another thing is uh just be vigilant um and pay attention that if you've got a couple of peppers that have aphids, you're probably going to have, or seedlings, you're going to have more. And just keep spraying them down with insecticidal soap, cold pressed Nemo, blasting them with water. It will dislodge them. And um, if you can get them early, they will not. Uh, well, if, am I thinking this right, Holly? Aphids are one of the insects can reproduce without mating. Am I not? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah so, they re- and they. It happens very rapidly. Yeah, so, uh, if you got a few now in two days, you're going to have a whole, whole lot. So, you, just like but they any, don't. I mean, they don't live very long. No, but they can yeah. do. They're they're the tick of the plant world. They will suck the juice out of your plant, and can and make your plant very distraught and stressed and vulnerable. And if you don't catch it, it can actually kill the plant. So absolutely. And so with the cold press neem oil, you're like, where do I find that? You can, you'd have to double check the ingredients when you, if you go from your art garden center, but I found ours at a local organic food co-op store. Uh-huh. Um, and just so you know, it smells like burnt rubber tires. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it's not, it's not going to, it's going to do the job. Right. Absolutely. So, it will, it will, yeah. Yeah. And we used it uh, on, we attempted to use it on scale for indoor fruit tree. Yeah. Indoor and, citrus tree. A citrus tree. And, and but we, that, it was kind of far beyond gone. Well, yeah. And scale is a very challenging uh, problem to yeah. eradicate from your citrus tree as it is. So with that being said, Holly, we are out of time and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? You can certainly do that by going to our parent website, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and clicking on the Season 7 tab at the top of the page. Or you can uh, send us an email to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com and we will send you a link to this show to get you caught up. Hey, tune in next week to the program. We're going to talk about does companion planting really work as well as mulch 
and what are your options for you in your garden, ornamental and edible. And our guest will be our good friend and host of PBS's Growing a Greener World, Joe Lampo, will be with us. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>